The opening stages of the space race had a clear winner, the Soviets, as basically everything they did absolutely blew the Americans' efforts out of the water. For example, they'd launched Sputnik 1, the world's first ever artificial satellite, on the 4th of October 1956, as well as launching Sputnik 2 not even a month later on the 3rd of November, which carried the first ever living creature into Earth's orbit, specifically a dog by the name of Laika. But those two famous missions, which we're willing to bet most of you have heard of, were just the tip of the iceberg, because the Soviets also launched Luna 1 on the 2nd of January 1959, the first spacecraft to ever reach the vicinity of our moon and orbit the sun, and then followed it up with Luna 2 and Luna 3, which were launched on the 12th of September and the 7th of October that same year, which became the first ever man-made objects to impact the moon and send back photographs of its far side, respectively. And then, as their piece de resistance, the Soviets sent a man into space and brought him back safe and well on the 12th of April 1961, specifically an Air Force pilot by the name of Yuri Gagarin. Needless to say, not a lot of this sparked much joy over in Washington, D.C., and so they set out to do something about it. But they wanted to do it big, not just to match the Soviets' achievements, but to utterly overshadow them. This proved to be easier said than done, however, because the U.S.'s first attempts at cracking the space chestnut were just a bit lacking, and that's putting it really politely. Take, for example, Vanguard TV-3, which was launched on the 6th of December 1957 and was intended to put a satellite into space, thus giving the US its own Sputnik. Rather than that, however, what it actually did was blow up on the launch pad. And then there was Pioneer Zero, which was launched on the 17th of August 1958 and had been intended to be the first spacecraft to orbit the moon. And it blew up 73.6 seconds after launch. The US's initial efforts were just not up to snuff, and the government was bitterly aware of that fact thanks to the ever-increasing amount of eggs that seemed to be piling up on their faces. Instead of suffering further humiliation, however, they instead decided to go back to the drawing board and start from scratch with a whole new rocket, the mighty Mercury Redstone Launch Vehicle. So let's take a look at it and see what it was all about. The Mercury Redstone launch vehicle was the product of the derivatively titled Mercury Project, which can be traced back to early 1958, when a preliminary working group was formed from staff of the Langley Aeronautical Laboratory and the Lewis Flight Propulsion Laboratory, both of them constituent parts of the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, or NACA, which would rebrand as the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, or NASA, later that year in an attempt to draw a line under its earlier failures and the, uh, rather, poor public image that it was forming as a result of all of those failures. This working group had a single goal, to bash out some preliminary ideas for finally developing a reliable manned rocket. The early spitballing seemed promising enough, and so this initial working group was formally reconstituted as the Joint Manned Satellite Panel in September 1958 with support from both the NACA and the Department of Defense's Army Research Projects Agency. It was then given further funding and resources to begin turning its preliminary ideas into a fully fleshed out plan of action. Come October of that same year, said fully fleshed out plan had been submitted and received its official rubber stamp, properly beginning the Mercury Project. Now, this plan involved securing both PGM-11 Redstone and PGM-19 Jupiter ballistic missiles and then putting them through extensive testing to see which would best serve as a base for adaptation into a manned rocket. Now, this might sound a bit counterintuitive at first, because if the whole point of the project was to do it right this time, as it were, then why adapt a pre-existing missile rather than building something bespoke, because surely a military rocket would be inherently suboptimal if used in civilian applications. Well, actually, as luck would have it, the affirmation preliminary spitballing had concluded with reasonable certainty that both rockets should work perfectly well despite their more martial original purpose, and besides, it was the space race. Speed was deemed absolutely vital, lest the Soviets pull even further ahead while they faffed about designing something posh from the ground up. And given that the rocket ended up being called the Mercury Redstone Launch Vehicle, guess which one ended up being selected? Yep. It was the Redstone. And with that settled, the real work had to begin, i.e. actually building it. Because while they might have already had the base rocket in the bag, they still had quite the checklist of modifications to work their way through to make it suitable for crewed use. And everything from developing a crew capsule to plonk on top of it, to optimizing the propellants, to making sure that the acceleration, noise, and vibrations were reined in enough so that the astronaut at the helm wasn't reduced to a some sort of paste. They also put a hell of a lot of work into refining launch facilities in order to protect ground personnel. They fully expected it to work, don't get us wrong, but uh, they really wanted to be safe just in case it blew up on the launch pad because of 
well, their track record. All of this work ended up being completed remarkably quickly, and come January 1960, they were ready to begin initial tests, the first of which was a static test of a Mercury Redstone launch vehicle, or just Mercury rocket, as we will call it herein to keep things simple, that the Army Ballistic Missile Agency rocket range in Alabama. This was a flyaway success, and so the rocket was put into storage pending the installation of its capsule, spacecraft number two. That was done later that year, and so, come the 21st of November, MR-1, the first Mercury mission, was initiated. Fortunately, this was just an unmanned test, because, well, it ended in complete failure, traveling a whole four inches before its motors cut out dead and it plonked back onto the ground. The cause? A premature motor shutdown caused by a ground support cable connection issue. So then, many coffee-fueled late nights ensued to iron out this newly discovered kink, and come the 19th of December 1960, they were ready to give it another go with a new launch, MR-1A. Designed to test the instrumentation and separation rockets, as well as the deceleration rockets and recovery system of the capsule, this one mercifully went perfectly. It took off, traveled 235 miles, separated, touched down in the drink of the Atlantic Ocean, and was recovered within 15 minutes, all without incident. Following the success of MR-1A, it was finally time for a manned launch on the 31st of January 1961. Kind of, because this little fellow, originally simply called Number 65 and later called Ham, was the one destined to be in the capsule of MR-2. You see, he was to be used to test out the life support and environmental control systems of the capsule before they stuck a human in it, because while he might have cost NASA $457, he was still a lot cheaper to replace than a human astronaut if the test ended up going belly up. Fortunately, however, it didn't, and after a brief 16-minute, 39-second flight amid the stars, Ham came back down to Earth and got to enjoy a well-earned retirement at the North Carolina Zoo, where he remained until he passed away in 1983 at the age of 25. After that, there was just one more unmanned test to be done before the first crewed flight, a March 1961 test launch of an unmanned rocket dubbed MRBD. This was to just test out a modified booster, which had been fettled with in order to reduce oscillations and vibrations. Nothing too exciting to report with this one, it worked perfectly. Everything's good. And then finally, it was time. NASA had closed their technological gap with the Soviets in a truly phenomenal time. And now, on the 5th of May, 1961, not even a month after Yuri Gagarin's flight, Alan Shepard stood poised to repeat the feat for the US from the seat of the Freedom 7 capsule, with his mission being dubbed MR3. As the countdown reached zero, the rocket's engines ignited, propelling Shepard skyward with a thunderous roar. As the rocket climbed higher, Shepard experienced increasing G-forces, reaching a maximum of 6.3 Gs before engine cutoff. This is about the same that a modern fighter pilot experiences in a reasonably hard turn. Despite the intense physical strain, however, Shepard maintained clear communication with mission control, providing real-time updates on his condition and the spacecraft's performance. 143 seconds into the flight, the rocket engines shut down as planned, and the Freedom 7 capsule separated from the booster. Throughout five minutes, Shepard experienced weightlessness, floating freely inside the capsule and conducting a series of manual tasks to assess his ability to function and control the spacecraft under microgravity conditions. The capsule also reached a maximum speed of 5,134 miles per hour at a peak altitude of approximately 116 miles, where Shepard captured this incredible photograph of the Earth below him. As the capsule began its descent, the automatic re-entry sequence was initiated. The heat shield deployed to protect the spacecraft from the intense heat generated during re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere, and Shepard endured another round of high G-forces as the capsule decelerated rapidly. Despite the extreme conditions, the re-entry process proceeded smoothly, and the capsule's parachutes deployed as planned, slowing its descent to a nice and safe pace. The Freedom 7 capsule splashed down in the Atlantic Ocean 15 minutes and 28 seconds after it had taken off, landing at a predetermined spot where recovery teams were already on standby. Helicopters quickly located the spacecraft and hoisted it out of the water, with Shepard still inside. Upon his safe return to the deck of the recovery ship, Shepard emerged and was immediately hailed as a national hero. Next came MR-4, which was launched on the 21st of July 1961, with the capsule Liberty Bell 7 sat atop it and Gus Grissom at the stick. Like MR-3 before it, it was a suborbital mission one that goes high enough to reach space, but whose trajectory prevents it from completing a revolution of the Earth. It was simple enough in focus, too, just being intended to gather further data on the performance of the Mercury rocket and its pilot during spaceflight. They reached 180 miles in altitude and flew for 15 minutes and 37 seconds before touching down at the Atlantic Ocean. Although successful in its goals, it did nearly end in a disaster as Liberty Bell 7 sank following splashdown due to a hatch malfunction. Fortunately, however, Grissom was pulled from it without suffering any serious injury. 
Next up was MR6 on the 20th of February 1962, piloted by John Glenn, sat inside the capsule Friendship 7. This one was not just another data-gathering flight, however, but an attempt to push the envelope, for it was the first American orbital space flight. Glenn completed a total of three Earth orbits in five hours, reaching a maximum altitude of 162 miles. Disaster nearly befell this one, too, because the automatic control system played up and ultimately failed. Fortunately, however, Glenn was a hell of a pilot, and so he manually hard-skilled it, completing the mission without suffering any injury. Oh, and if you're wondering what happened to MR5, uh, we haven't forgotten about it, don't worry. It was just another monkey mission that we really don't have the time to get into today, but just don't worry too much about it. As for MR7, that was flown by Scott Carpenter on the 24th of May 1962, with this capsule being named Aurora 7. Just like Glenn's flight before him, it was another orbital flight with him completing the same number of orbits in roughly the same amount of time, although he did go a touch higher, peaking at 166 miles. The purpose of this one was easy enough. Glenn's flight had left NASA with no end of questions about the effects of weightlessness on the body, and by getting up there, unbuckling himself and wriggling about for a bit, Carpenter would see them answered. These answers very nearly came at a high price, though, because Carpenter faced navigational issues and splashed down 250 miles off target. Fortunately, however, he was safely recovered. MR8 saw Walter Shearer at the Stick of Sigma 7 push things even further, with him conducting a total of six Earth orbits, give or take nine hours, to test the effects of prolonged weightlessness. It launched on the 3rd of October 1962, and after reaching a new American max altitude of 175 miles, he touched down successfully with laser precision, meaning that we have no near accidents to report for this one. Then there was the final mission, MR9, which launched on the 15th of May 1963 with Gordon Cooper at the helm of its capsule Faith 7. Since President Kennedy had publicly announced the American Moon mission the previous year and the Mercury rocket was proving itself to be a reliable enough little workhorse, the main focus for this mission was to push it to the max and learn all about how the human body held up under what was, for then, an extreme amount of time spent in space, 34 hours to be precise, during which time Cooper orbited the Earth a total of 22 times with a peak altitude of 165 miles. All went well during the mission, and he landed without incident. And with that, Project Mercury came to an end. It had achieved everything it had set out to do, having caught the US up with the Soviets and given them a wealth of technical knowledge to boot. But ultimately, it was now surplus to requirements as its success of the Gemini rocket was now beginning to near completion and due to take flight early in the following year. And so its story ended. So let's bring this chapter to a close, and let's move on to have a look at the actual technical ins and outs of the Mercury rocket itself. The Mercury rocket was, as we've already discussed, a modified PGM-11 Redstone ballistic missile. But to write it off as just a tarted up ballistic missile is to do a disservice to the monumental minds that worked their fingers to the bone to produce that phenomenal vehicle, because actually a lot of work went into modifying it for crewed flight. For example, its propellant tanks were elongated to lengthen the nominal burn time of the engines from 123.5 to 143.5 seconds. But even this wasn't just as simple as welding a little bit of extra metal on the end, because it meant that a 7th auxiliary nitrogen tank had to be fitted to keep all of that extra fuel under pressure and thus able to be properly fed to the engine, as well as having an extra tank of hydrogen peroxide fitted to power the engine's turbo pump for long enough, that being the bit that actually squirts the fuel into the engine. Quite a bit of work for just an extra 20 seconds of go, isn't it? And speaking of the engine, the specific model stuffed into the Mercury rocket was a Rocketdyne Model A7, which generated 78,000 pounds of thrust at sea level and allowed a top speed of 5,180 miles per hour. To put that thrust figure to some perspective for you, the latest Saturn V of moon landing fame produced about 1.5 million pounds of thrust at sea level. The A7 used ethyl alcohol as fuel and liquid oxygen as its oxidizer. It also came equipped with an automatic thrust adjustment system. To ensure control and stability during flight, the Mercury rocket was equipped with carbon jet vanes located in the exhaust of the propulsion unit, coupled with air rudders. These vanes deflected said carbon gases out of the rocket to provide control. Think of its operation like this. You know when you sit down in an office chair and let rip with a CO2 fire extinguisher to push yourself along? <laughs> because everyone's done that, haven't they? It's basically that, though, in space. Such considerations proved to be a big and clever idea, too, because it turns out that the Mercury rocket wasn't exactly the most stable, particularly compared to its normal missile equivalent, particularly as it hit transonic speeds and started to push against the sound barrier, which would normally hit 80 seconds after liftoff. 
To further help with this, the Mercury rocket was essentially autopilot controlled, when it worked anyway, as John Glenn would no doubt be able to attest to. The system had control across all three axes of flight, pitch, or up and down, roll, or rotating, and yaw, uh, left and right. All in all then, although it was nothing by later rocket standards, for its time, it's fair to say that the Mercury rocket was a pretty high-tech and cutting-edge bit of kit. And so, now, we reach the end of today's video. But while time constraints stop us from diving any deeper today, that doesn't mean that no greater depth can be reached. Quite the opposite, in fact. Because while it might be overlooked in the historical zeitgeist, often just being written off as the rocket that carried Alan Shepard into space before its much, much more powerful younger sibling carried man to the moon, the Mercury rocket was every bit the trailblazing piece of engineering that the Saturn V was. And thus, there is way more to this story that you can dive into should you wish to. And if you do indeed wish to do so, well, we've got a reading recommendation for you, specifically The Mercury Redstone Project, published by NASA themselves all the way back in 1964. It's a 294-page technical history of the entire project written by the people who actually worked on it shortly after its termination, which meant it was still fresh in their minds. History doesn't really get much better than that, and it was indeed one of the key sources for today's video. It's also available free on NASA's website because well, that's nice, isn't it? Thanks for watching.